Hello, and welcome to this episode of Burn Your Draft, the podcast exploring the Reed Senior thesis process and experience. I'm your host, Albert Corellis, and today we'll be talking with Reed Linguistics grad Monty Benish about their thesis on the encoding of gender in the sound of our speech. Monty will do a better job of explaining it than I could. I'm Montreal Benish. My pronouns are they, them. I'm from New Jersey. I was a linguistics major at Reed, and my thesis was called Stylizing the Self, a First Look into the Concurrent Fluidity of Gender and Language, and my advisor was Samir. My thesis, it lives in the realm, the subfield of linguistics that's sociophonetics, so sociolinguistics, which has to do with identity and the interactions between language and identity. What I was looking at is how gender fluid people are constructing their identities through the way they speak. So I did a little experiment with six gender fluid readies, and I measured a phonetic variable, uh, specifically s, like the sound s, and where the frequency of it, seeing if there was correlation between that phonetic variation and their gender variation. In the literature on like constructions of identity, S is a pretty common one. You see correlations of higher frequency S with both femininity, but also kind of like queer masculinities that are using the existing link to femininity to kind of separate themselves from stereotypical straight masculinity. And I measured gender in a bunch of different ways, but what I ended up seeing was referencing that previous literature, thinking only about the masculine and feminine scales I used. Three of my speakers, as they felt more masculine, used a higher frequency S, which I explained as being like, you know, that non-straight masculinity. And one of my speakers, as they felt less masculine or more feminine, which happened to correlate for them, used a higher frequency S. So explained with the traditional link of femininity with this higher frequency S. Now I'm not going to be able to stop paying attention to S sounds throughout the whole rest of this. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Yeah. How, how did you get into linguistics? Like, were you always interested in the linguistics of gender or, or did this kind of like pop up later? That definitely popped up later. I grew up around languages. It's something I've been thinking about for most of my life. English is my dad's third language. Mm -hmm. Growing up around Romanian, which is his first language, and French, I was always surrounded by people speaking these other languages mm -hmm. that I didn't speak as a kid. I speak French now. I'm still <laughs> learning Romanian. And then also with my mom, mm -hmm. separate households, but my mom speak Spanish. In the house growing up, we sometimes speak Spanish. It's something I've been around a lot yeah. and thought about since I was a kid. But then being from the East Coast, MIT does a program that's kind of like Paideia, but it's specifically targeted towards high schoolers. Nice. So people in the MIT community can teach classes like Paideia and kind of whatever they want, whatever they're passionate about, and high schoolers can come and take them. And my sophomore year, I took a little uh, intro to linguistics mm -hmm. class and also a class on Tolkien's languages in The Lord of the Rings. That's pretty fun. Yeah. Oh, it was super cool. <laughs> and those classes both kind of made me realize, like, oh, this is a thing people do. That, like, mm -hmm. it's not something, I mean, but this made me realize that it's a job you can have. So I did know I was going to do linguistics when I came in. It really came down to two colleges for me, uh, Reed and Wesleyan in Connecticut. Um, the big factors were linguistics. Wesleyan didn't actually have a linguistics program. I would have been a math major there, which mm -hmm. I probably also would have enjoyed, but very different path. Yeah. I visited them both, and Reed felt a lot better. <laughs> I didn't actually visit Reed until after I'd gotten in, because New Jersey to Oregon you know, Certain it's a pretty mind. big trip, but I do poi. I was part of WMD, um, Weapons of Mass Distraction, when I was at Reed, and I, I, I did poi even before getting to Reed. So I went to the fire spinning troops performances at both Reed and Wesleyan, and at Reed, I, like, chatted with the people afterwards, and we ended up hanging out for a couple hours. Mm -hmm. I really clicked with the people there, and Wesleyan, I didn't have that same kind of instant connection with. And also, Reed gave me more financial aid, uh, so helps. it was, yeah. Yeah. Reed was the cheapest place, um, so. For all the people who don't know what Poi is and didn't figure it out from context, can you explain that just real quick? Poi is a form of flow arts. It's traditionally from the Māori culture, in like New Zealand and other mm -hmm. Polynesian cultures, but it's like two weights, or if you're doing it in a fire, like heavier wicks at the ends of strings that you dance with, nice. spin around. Sweet. Yeah. Thanks. Mm -hmm. So come to read, you get into linguistics. What were the kind of 
skills that you had to develop to end up writing a whole thesis about S sounds? Because I assume that you were not in a place to do that after your MIT high school class. Absolutely not. And I mean, not even after freshman year. So the Ling major really starts your sophomore year. The intro class is a 200 level class. So my freshman year, I didn't Mm -hmm. take any linguistics classes. I feel like the skills I gained really Mm -hmm. came primarily in junior year because sophomore year you know, I took a handful of classes, but I was abroad, or at least for the beginning of spring of 2020, I was abroad. So not taking linguistics classes. Mm-hmm. The specific skills, I had some research experience coming in from high school. I actually went to a vocational high school for life sciences. It's a public magnet school in New Jersey that just happened to be in my county. So I had some research experience, but there was one specific class in the linguistics major. It's called Methods of Design and Analysis. And it's basically a semester-long thesis. It's like a mini-thesis. And that class, I feel like, prepared me really well for the process because I kind of had a really good, clear idea of what the timeline was going to look like. Like, first I'd look into the literature and find a question, then I'd do this, then I'd do that, etc. And as far as the actual other skills, like the actual analysis of the data also was an important thing. Um, using PROT, which is the auditory analysis program I used and is pretty common in yeah. the linguistics field. What was like the, the day-to-day process of doing your thesis research? I feel like what the day-to-day process looked like was so different every month of my thesis. At the beginning, it was a lot of reading. First, it was a lot of finding articles, which was the easiest part, probably. Mm-hmm. And then it was a lot of reading the articles, which was like a little bit diff- more difficult. <laughs> Doing the IRB proposal, so like coming up with the design and writing it all up for the Institutional Review Board. That was kind of November, and I spent the rest of the first semester pretty much writing my first chapter and getting materials ready to be able to start working with participants. How I actually collected the data with participants was Mm -hmm. I met with them once uh, at the beginning to kind of talk about the project, make sure it was something they wanted to participate in after knowing the details. And then I sent them out into the world with instructions. Mm -hmm. And those instructions were to send me a voice recording of themselves talking for like two to three minutes, just kind of about their day when they felt like they were at different genders. So they would send me that two to three minute recording. Uh, They would also do a reading passage. Mm -hmm. Um, They'd read the same little paragraph for me every time. And then they would take a little survey that I had made, and they would answer the survey right after the recording, telling me what their gender was like at the moment when they recorded it. Another thing I did in that first meeting was devise gender scales with them. That was one of the things I kind of thought about the most in this, was how I was going to both accurately and affirmingly reflect my participants' genders while also having things I could actually quantify. And so what I ended up doing was I kind of asked participants to talk about what gender fluidity looked like for them and pick a word or short phrase that kind of encapsulated one end of their gender spectrum. Like, in a moment in time, how would you describe your gender? And then say, like, okay, well, if you're feeling, like, really low on that descriptor, what other thing would you feel higher on? Mm -hmm. So like one participant, the first thing they came up with was nail polish was the phrase. And it like, the thing is it means like something more specific to them, but like, this is the word that encapsulates it all. And I was like, okay, well, if you're feeling low on nail polish, what are you feeling higher on? Uh, And that was lawnmower for that. That's so good. Right. So every time they took the survey, it would be a little scale from zero to six of feminine and then a separate one zero to six masculine like how masculine are you feeling how feminine Mm -hmm. um and then how nail polish are you feeling how lawnmower are you feeling there was also Mm -hmm. a a closeness to gender scale which is how i tried to incorporate a genderness into it so zero being a gender like not at all close to gender six being like fully gender all the gender you know yeah God, I, I need, like, the, the next time that I have to fill out my gender on a form, I need the drop down to include, like, lawnmower and nail <laughs> polish. Mm-hmm. Some of the other ones were um, flannel and glitter. Nice. Uh, foliage and riverbank. Nice. Swag and womanhood, which was one of my That's favorites. That's really iconic. Right? Um, honor bound and defiant. Mm. They were a bunch of cool scales. So that was winter break over winter break their instructions were to send me those recordings 
at least once a week. Eh, responses varied. I got between three and 11 responses. Well, that's mm -hmm. from the six who sent me things. I had three other people who didn't end up sending me anything, which is fine, you know. So by the time I got back from winter break, I had a pretty, pretty good chunk of data to transcribe and scrape data. Mm -hmm. I used a lot of automated processes to do that, so I didn't have to like go through by hand and measure the S's. So when I went through with the automated measuring of S frequency, there are a lot of different steps in that automation. So there was the transcription, there was aligning the transcription with the audio, which is like a phoneme to phoneme alignment. Yeah. And then there was the actual like thing that would go through the transcript and take any time there was an S and measure the frequency. And somewhere along the line, mm -hmm. some of the values for S got a little low. So they're like in the 500 to 1,000 hertz range, which is a lot, a lot lower than yeah. expected for the sound. It was really a problem for, for one of my speakers primarily, kind of two of them. A few of them just kind of looked as expected. So it was more weird than anything else. And I'm not sure if it was, mm -hmm. a, it could have been a lot of different things. It could have been the automation. It could also have been the recording quality because I had people recording on their phones yeah. and sending me the audio over as in a WhatsApp voice message. Mm -hmm. And like, I was expecting variation, but it is highly improbable that those sounds are actually... I feel like I kind of jumped right in with the conclusions of the beginning, which is that like three participants patterned one way, one person patterned a different way, two people I didn't see any correlation with. And I actually also, in the little post-recording survey they took, they also talked about other aspects of their identity they were feeling at the moment. Not in that those aspects are fluid, but the percent to which they're um, at the front of the mind is different. So mm -hmm. I had people say like, how strongly is your race, your ethnicity, your SES yeah. kind of affecting how you feel about your identity in this moment? And for those two people who had no correlation, it was like with any of the things I measured. Interesting. So did they have like really consistent S sounds? Were they like way too variable to match the data? So one of them was the person who only sent me three recordings. And I think that I just may have not gotten enough variation in yeah. S, but also in identity to really draw meaningful conclusions between them. That makes sense. But the other person is the person who sent me 11 recordings. So again, it's possible that they just didn't get to a combination of identities that would have led to a variation in S. It's also possible that they just speak very consistently across their mm -hmm. range of gender. One other part of my results that I'm still thinking about is that, okay, so I said that like one person patterned differently. I don't know if, if I scaled up this study, if the kind of proportion would stay the same of three to one, or if I happen to just get one person from this group that would be a larger percentage, or this person is actually a gender fluid alter of someone with dissociative identity disorder. So... Believe it or not, there's no research on like encoding of sociological knowledge in alters of people with DID. So I w I'm wondering if that would affect it, and that's something I'm kind of thinking about in all this. I have a specific filter when I do my podcast stuff that is a, a de mm -hmm. that like purposely is taking out uh, all the S frequencies. I'm just gonna have to yeah. turn that off. Full, full S. Full S. The first full S edition of this podcast. <laughs> I'd like to go to grad school um, for linguistics, so I'd be using all these skills, I'd be writing another thesis. Writing a lot more of these. I took some time off, because I was not about to go right from read into grad school. Yeah, I also didn't want to be writing applications while thesising and working 20 hours a week. It was just not going to be good. Yeah. So I ended up presenting my thesis research at several different conferences, nice. which was really a great opportunity and really fun. You know, I met, I met so many cool people. Get to nerd um, out with all and like, with. Yeah, I have talked about my thesis with several people I cited in it. And like, they'll come up to me after That's my talk so and be sick. like, that was so cool. Like, I love what you're doing. Um, let's chat about, oh nice. my God. Yeah, it's been, it's been very cool. Are you getting other people to use the, the nail polish lawnmower scale? <laughs> I wish, I wish. I have gotten, <laughs> it's become part of a larger conversation about how we measure gender in, in studies, and I think it is helping, like, push that conversation forward. Yeah. People are thinking about using similar, talking to people and having them come up with their own scales. Yeah. The thing arises when you're trying to do a larger scale study of how to scale up this kind of thing, where I had an hour-long conversation with each participant about this, and how mm -hmm. do you yeah. do that in a larger scale? 
scale, which I did have questions about during my conference talks. And um, that makes sense. I'm talking with other people who are working. There's stuff coming down the pipe. So one of the conferences I spoke at is the kind of the big queer linguistics conference that happened last year. And they are doing an edited collection mm -hmm. of like a book based on some of the talks there. Nice. So I'm writing it up for a chapter in this book, which That's I'm very so excited sick. about. That's right? so exciting. <laughs> Do you have like lots of grand ideas about what's in between Reed and grad school and, and what you might want to like get up to? Right now, I actually just got a part-time job working at the National Museum of Language in D.C., I'm working remotely. They're actually a virtual museum. They don't have a brick and mortar location. It's all on their website. Interesting. And they are looking to develop content so they can do little Zoom sessions live in classrooms. It's kind of like a field trip. That's so cool. Yeah. Another job I held at Reed was I worked at Science Outreach for my first few years. It is very similar to that job. Mm -hmm. So I'm doing that, but in a language way. Yeah. Is like science communication something that's really interesting to you? Or is it just like what's available? I'd like to teach eventually. So yeah, yeah I guess science communication. Nice. I also worked at the reactor while I was at Reed. So I have a lot of experience with it. A lot of what we do is give tours to the public. Mm -hmm. It just happened to be that the first job that got back to me about mm -hmm. things isn't something I hate. And nice. is actually something I find very <laughs> interesting. That's good. I feel like that's important. Do you have advice to, to future readies, either just like about read in general or about the thesis specifically? The thing that helped me the most at read was developing a healthy sleep schedule. Having a bedtime was revolutionary. Yes. It was life-changing. Bedtime and is so important. It's so important. And I remember freshman year, a senior said to me, like, you need to get your sleep shit sorted out. And I was like, mm, okay. But he was right. He was very right for that. The other advice that I got was also in that class I mentioned, uh, Methods of Design and Analysis. Kara was like, you need to pick a thesis topic that's still going to be interesting to work on when it's winter in Portland and it's gray and you're sad and you can't go outside but you need, and you need to work. Yeah. You need to pick something you're still going to be excited to come back to. <laughs> you know, I see people working on theses that they're just not that interested in that they're doing because like... Mm -hmm. It's their advisor's work or whatever. And it like there's nothing wrong with that. I just, I had a better thesis because I mm -hmm. really interested in and really cared about the stuff I was doing. Yeah. Are there any like shout outs that you want to give to your people who supported you during your thesis process? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, first of all, Samir and Kara of the linguistics department, absolute legends. They're both the best and were so helpful in this process. Friends, uh, Maya, Ara, Ruby. Friends are important. Also, uh, Samir's other thesis students, Gregory and Sam. We had lab meetings, which I feel like that year the other linguistics professors weren't doing that. And it was just so helpful to like meet every week with mm -hmm. two other thesis and seniors and be like, oh, I'm not super far behind. We are all here and we're all getting through this together. Yes. Thanks for being on the pod, Monty. Yeah, you're welcome. This was fun. Thanks so much, Monty. He and my roommates are now deeply in love with your gender scales. It's been months since we did this recording, and when someone is looking especially ready for yard work, we'll still ask, feeling lawnmower today? I hope you'll join us again to hear more from students and alumni about what it means to burn your draft. If you like this episode, be sure to subscribe, check out our Twitter and Facebook pages, and rate and review us on Apple Podcasts. Burn Your Draft is a production of Reed College and the Center for Life Beyond Reed, created jointly by students, alumni, and staff. This episode was produced, hosted, and engineered by me, Reed College student Albert Corellis. Our executive producer is Seth Paskin, class of 1990, with technical advising from Joe Janiga. Our project manager is Nate Martin, class of 2016. Our intro and outro music is by Jack Salvucci, class of 2020, and our podcast art was made by alumni Henry Gotchlik and Lillian Pham. This podcast was made possible by a gift from Seth Paskin.